Well, hello everyone. I'm a Prajata, a story scholar with the 1947 Partition Archive. I'm also pursuing PhD in Partition Literature, and it is my pleasure to be your host today. Welcome to the 75 Days of Partition series. This is day 63 of hosting esteemed guests for the series, which will continue till August 17. Today, we will be speaking to Manreet Sodhi Someshwar. Let me start by giving a brief bio of her. Manreet Sodhi Someshwar is an award-winning and best-selling writer of eight books, including the Merunesa series, the critically acclaimed The Long Walk Home, and The Radiance of a Thousand Suns, and most recently, the Partition Triology. Hailed as a star on the literary horizon by Krishwan Singh and garnering endorsements from Gulzar for two of her books, Manreet and her work have featured at literary festivals in Singapore, Shanghai, and Hong Kong, India, and NYC. Her articles have appeared in the New York Times, the South China Morning Post, and several Indian publications. Manreet lives in New York City with her husband, daughter, and cat. Welcome again, ma'am. Thank you, Aprajita. It's, an, it's a pleasure to be here with you today. Uh, since this is a micro uh, burst of conversations, I will directly jump to my first question. Uh, so your books are based uh, on extensive research on partition. Um, please tell us how did that journey start and what were your experiences? Thank you. Um, I think for any uh, discussion about my writing journey, I have to go back to my hometown, which is on the border between India and Pakistan. It's called Firozpur. And uh, Firozpur is divided from Pakistan by the Satluj River. So it's a riverine border town. And uh, when I was growing up, I was aware that there were many stories that were uh, sort of prevalent in the town. There were many stories in the conversations of people, all of which sort of referred to this place, this thing called Wand. Uh, you know, as a child, you have uh, really no interest in what your grown-ups are talking about. And I didn't pay any attention to what this Wand was, sometimes Matwara. Um, but as you grow, you start to hear and you read your textbooks and the idea of partition and what partition was, you kind of start to understand that. And I had sort of barely begun to comprehend uh, the partition of the subcontinent, which led to the creation of Pakistan, when uh, in Punjab began the period of militancy, you know, which is called the lost decade, but is actually close to a 15 year period. And I, again, saw it very closely because my father was a criminal lawyer and uh, it was pretty common for us, uh, you know, in the middle of the night, the doorbell would ring, my father would get summoned by one of uh, the farmers who would come and say that his son had been plucked by the police in the middle of the night. And could we go, could he come with him to file an FIR? And uh, the thing is that at that time in Punjab, we had something called TADA, which was the Terrorist uh, Disruptive Activities Act. And essentially under that act, uh, a person could be kept in jail without uh, being allowed bail. And uh, to cut a long story short, I once again heard conversations amongst the adults about how this period uh, in the 80s was so reminiscent and so much like 47. You know, people would say, Eta one day to baratu, one day fa fa you know, so, and I think that's the time when I uh, tried to understand exactly what this was. And, you know, when, when you are growing up in a place, you take your background and things around you as part of uh, the landscape. You don't pay attention to it. But then I realized that, you know, our favorite Mithai Kadukan, it was called Kasuri on the Hatti. You know, like, and that's when I started connecting the dots, Kasuri on the Hatti, because this family has migrated from Kasur, which was now left in Pakistan. And that's why, uh, you know, their relationship with Pakistan now is through naming this shop after their Vatan, their homeland, right? They are in Western Punjab, in Indian Punjab, but their home. The claim to the home is still in Pakistan, in uh, Punjab, Western Punjab. 
And once I started delving into this, I also came across Kushwan Singh's train to Pakistan, which unfortunately I came to very late in life. And it was almost like a bulb went off in my mind because I think that novel taught me more about, about partition, about uh, the, 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 the period of six months after 15th August uh, and what was happening in Punjab. And I thought that all my history textbooks, uh, none of them had been able to give me that insight. So that is what, uh, you know, uh, but I was like any other halfway bright student. I was uh, pursuing academics and, you know, I, I heard it all and I shrugged it away. I went on to do engineering, went to business school, started work in Mumbai. And then at some point in time, uh, we moved out of India on my husband's job. And I felt this urge to sit down and write stories about, you know, things that I had seen. And this was in the early 2000s. And I started with short stories, trying to capture what I had seen during the Punjab militancy. And I realized that I didn't know what I was writing about. I had no idea. Uh, so I went back to, you know, to the libraries. I started reading books to understand that. When I would go back to India, I would speak to my elders, my parents, all those aunts and uncles and relatives and neighbors whom, while growing up, I had ignored because, you know, I thought their conversations didn't interest me and now I wanted to know I wanted to know more so in a sense I was doing my own oral history uh, you know speaking to people and trying to understand but obviously there was that pushback now nobody wanted to talk about it you know the common refrain is like why do you want to bring it up you know it is such a painful period but I persisted because I knew I was on to something not because I wanted to get those stories, but I wanted to get an understanding of them for myself. And again, you know, to cut a long story short, the short story I started with, it took me nine years, but the book came out in 2009. It became a novel. It's called The Long Walk Home. And it really looks at the uh, 20th century history of Punjab through one family, which is on the border, settled on the border. So I it, it captures 1947, it captures 1984. And the book went to Gulzar Saab and we were very fortunate that he liked it enough and you know, sort of gave advanced praise for it. But that's how my journey began. It began with trying to understand my own hometown and the stories of my uh, people who were around me. And I am still on this journey, still trying to understand. Uh, it is very curious that you mention uh, Krishwan Singh, Train to Pakistan, and how it was for the longest time that uh, literature was the only way uh, that we could have, we could deal with this incomprehensible, incomprehensible, incoherent uh, event that had happened. And there was no other way to express it than what has just taken place. Um, so do you also think that, you know, through literature, through fiction, that you are trying to understand this event in better terms? Yes, I, I think I would agree. Uh, the Most people have some idea of partition, but just to put it in context, you know, the, the kafilas, they went east and west uh, during uh, and. 1947, it's considered the largest migration in modern human history, 15 million people going across the border. We also lost, the estimates are three to five million people who lost their lives. And it is such a cataclysm. In Punjabi, uh, you know, stories, in conversations, people say, parle aagi, you see, you know, it's, uh, in Hindi we say, prale. So, Whenever we are faced as human beings with circumstances, with situations which are so traumatic, the way our mind comprehends it is that we refer to earlier stories, earlier narratives, and try to put sense on what is happening. So the idea that when people who went through 47 called it parle, you know, they are, they are obviously referring to our mythological texts which talk about that a time when you know nothing makes sense and i think for the generations after that uh, the words of storytellers and writers who grappled with 
with partition, its aftermath, whether it's Manto, Amrita Pritam, Kushwan Singh, Gulzar Saab, uh, you know, the whole pantheon of writers, they are trying to understand for themselves what has happened. And the power of literature, good literature, is that as a reader, then we bring our own senses to it and we get understanding out of that as well. And I feel that also our history textbooks are dry. They do not engage with a text which is so emotional at the core. Uh, they do not give us an understanding of why it happened and how it happened. Also, I think at the time of 1947, we were a newly independent nation and the priorities were to get back on our feet, to develop the nation um, after 250, 300 years of misrule by the colonial empire. So the priorities were different. But the thing with trauma is that it lives in our bodies. It lives in our minds. It doesn't go away. And which is why the second, third generation, which is now uh, trying to understand what happened? Why did it happen? And I think literature, poetry, art, theater, all of these have a role to play because what they do is they take that general experience because we, we do not know individual people who suffer at that time. So they take that general experience and they make it individual. They, they take the general and they make it specific for us. And that's the way the human mind works. Once we understand a story, once we find our way into a story, we begin to grapple with it better. So I think that is really, uh, you know, the power of storytelling and why all these stories with partition resonate to this day, right? Uh, thank you so much, ma'am, for sharing your insights on that. Uh, and that brings me to my next question that since you're talking that uh, we each and every individual that were a part of that traumatic scene. So how do you shape your characters in your novels? For example, there's Baksh, there is uh, Sipoy Malik, Tara. Uh, how do you derive these characters thought behind them? Hmm. That's a very interesting question. And I don't know if I have a simple answer for it. But, you know, let me sort of try and grapple with it. I think uh, because I am a writer of historical fiction and I engage with history, which you know certainly my parents, my grandparents have lived with to an extent, uh, research is very important to me. So I spend a lot of time in the archives. I also spend a lot, I have spent a lot of time talking to people and gathering my own oral narratives. But the thing is that uh, I am a novelist. I am not a nonfiction writer which means that after I've got all the research done and hopefully have begun to understand uh, you know, the event, I have to then craft it into a story, a story that people will read, that will come in a novel form. And the idea is that you want people to keep flipping the pages without thinking, oh, yeah, it's a history lesson. Right? So, the, so, and the only way I can do that is by having characters who are compelling. You know, a character ka heart pagar ke uh, reader story mein ja sakta hai. Narrative se travel kar sakta hai. So that is my my goal in a sense when I when I sit down to write. Uh, also, when I when I'm writing uh, these novels, I have two uh, sort of objectives in mind. One objective is that during partition, uh, you know, the violence of partition, especially. Women suffered, and women, women suffered greatly. You know, a lot of uh, researchers will tell you that in, uh, in the violence of partition, it was the women's bodies that became the battlefield. And yet, year after year, when 15th August comes around, we mark it, we commemorate it. And most of our stories are about the sacrifices, the valor of our leaders. Uh, all of whom tend to be men. And I'm not saying that we should not be doing it. We should absolutely be doing it. But then there is another part of the story, which is the women and their sort of heroic role that they played in, 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 in the violence they encountered. They survived the violence. They went on to build their lives, build their families. Uh, there are women who did not survive. 
There were women who were asked to seal their lips, not talk about it. So it is my uh, intention with my stories to have women front and center. So all, you know, I'm trying to, so I write female characters with agency. I want my women to be able to speak, to have conversations, to be able to discuss what happened. So that is one thing. I'm trying to remove women, you know, from the interstices of history. You know, history has kind of hidden them away. I want to get them out. I want to bring them sent up, up front and I want them to speak. So that is important to me. I think the other thing which is important to me is that history is a very contested area. And I feel that a lot of times we look at our political leaders, um, Jawaharlal Nehru, Vallabhai Patel, uh, Mahatma Gandhi, Jinnah, uh, even Vicky Mountbatten, who was the viceroy at the time. And we almost look at them like cardboard characters. But the fact is that they were human beings. They were flesh and blood people. They also had mothers and fathers and children in their lives. So my attempt is also to look at them as human beings and try to understand what is going on in their mind when they are grappling with these huge decisions about, uh, about people, about land, about governance. So for instance, in the Partition Trilogy, uh, the first book released last year, it's called Lahore. And there are two threads. There is the Delhi thread <clears throat> where Jawaharlal Nehru, Bullabhai Patel and Dicky Mountbatten are my characters. So what I'm doing then is I'm getting into the head and saying, what are they thinking when they are taking these decisions? And the other thread is the Aam Admi and Orat who are based in Lahore, through whom I'm trying to show the decisions being taken in Delhi, how are they impacting those ordinary people in Lahore? So those are the two objectives. Uh, I think uh, that's the point, you know, when the uh, reader uh, relates himself or herself with the character, it is relatable. That's when the uh, reader starts to understand and enjoy the uh, whole uh, thing. Um, <coughs> it in completely uh, and the archive has also been this, doing the same you know teaching uh, uh, the younger generations via oral history and uh, they have been recording the personal narratives of all these people so that they can you know the, the tragedy has a face they can relate to them they can come to terms with their pain uh, Arkai have has been uh, dedicated to doing that. Um, now about your like the most recent book that you just mentioned, Lahore. Uh, why did you specifically choose to base to your story? in Lahore about these common people that you're talking about you're from uh, story from. So why did you, you know, for depicting this partition, why did you choose Lahore in the first place? Okay, that, that's a wonderful question. Uh, so just to give a sense of what the Partition Trilogy, which has three books, uh, book one is Lahore, book two is Hyderabad, and book three is Kashmir. And Lahore book one looks at the nine months leading up to the independence and partition of India. And Hyderabad and Kashmir are set in the 18 months after. Now, Hyderabad and Kashmir were the two large princely states which were still to be integrated into India. They were independent. They could choose to go to Pakistan or India. And I think there are phenomenal stories there, some of which we have forgotten. And the idea is to bring them alive. But to go to your question, why Lahore to tell uh, the story of pre-partition India leading up to independence and partition? I think... Uh, one, I was very clear that, um, you know, I am a Punjabi. As I said, I grew up in a border town. I grew up listening to stories of uh, Lahore because my father's, my father was younger at the time, but my Tayaji, my father's elder brothers, studied in Lahore, in FC College Lahore. And I, you know, grew up listening to those stories of Lahore. I watched as letters came from his friends who were in Lahore. And though I had never traveled to Lahore, I felt ki Lahore se rishta hai. You know, I, Lahore is what I got in my virsa. It is part of my viraset. Also, when I was growing up, uh, you know, we used to get better reception from Pakistan TV than um, Doordarshan, which was in Amritsar at that time. So I also grew up watching Pakistan TV, TV series. And also at 6, 6.30 in the evening, uh, PTV would have a ghazal program where Mehdi Asan Saab or Madam Noor Jahan would be singing live. 
in in a studio in Lahore, and my parents would that was their hour. They would my mother would be chopping vegetables and listening to that. Uh, my father would be resting after a day of work and listening to the guzzles. So the guzzles were a part of the atmosphere of our home. And uh, once again, you know, as a child, it, it, it's it's just there. You don't pay attention. But when I was older and I looked back, I realized how much that was a part of me, you know, a part of my growing up, uh, as I said, my virsa. So Lahore had, therefore, you know, an emotional connection for me. Also in purely storytelling terms, um, you know, the Lahore was always sort of the seat of Punjab. The two great cities of Punjab are Lahore and Amritsar. Amritsar was seen as the commercial capital of Punjab. Lahore was a cultural capital. You know, it was the seat of uh, Ranjit Singh Sikh Empire. And Lahore also was with almost 50-50 uh, with the non-Muslims and Muslims. Muslims in a slight majority. Um, and the kind of uh, speculation that was happening, uh, you know, people had no idea where the boundary line was. Where would Radcliffe draw his line? So there was a lot of speculation in the days leading up to partition where Lahore would go. I think most people had the assumption that Amritsar would stay within Indian Punjab because Amritsar is sort of seen as the Vatican of the Sikhs, right? So it would not make sense to have Amritsar with Golden Temple, with its legacy for the Sikh religion to be in uh, what would be the new nation of Pakistan. In Lahore, there were a lot of conflicting claims. The, the trade in Lahore was with the, uh, with the Hindus. The, a lot of the Sikh uh, places of worship, places of the birth of the Gurus, is in the neighborhood, in the area around Lahore, in and around Lahore. And the Muslims, as I said, were in a slight majority. So Lahore, in a sense, was the perfect microcosm of Punjab. You know, it was a city where if you take the large state of Punjab and distill it down, it was a nice replica to work with. There were no ghettos in Lahore. There was no area, ki Sikh colony, hai, ye Muslim colony, hai, Hindu colony. People lived uh, cheek by jowl. They lived, the, their neighbor across could be a Muslim, a Sikh, Hindu, because they were all Punjabis. And therefore, for a, a novelist, Lahore for me was a fascinating city in which to put my novel because I wanted to capture the confusion, the dilemma, uh, the rumors that are happening as uh, 15th August is drawing near and nobody knows where their hometown is going to be, where their home is going to be, where the boundary line is going to fall. Will it divide their field, their home, their hometown? Nobody has an idea. And I'm trying to capture that in Lahore, my novel. Also, some people may not be aware, but the boundary line, what we call the Radcliffe line, became public news only on 17th August, which means that independence happened. 14th August is Pakistan's Independence Day, 15th August India's Independence Day, partition happened, and yet people had no idea where their home was. Was it in Pakistan? or in India. Uh, and that is another reason why uh, Lahore was just the perfect place uh, to set the novel in. Now that sounds very interesting, ma'am. Um, also, you mentioned the other two books that will be part of this trilogy. One you said is Hyderabad and another is Kashmir. Uh, so what the audience can expect, what's coming next? What, what are they going to be about? So Hyderabad will release this September, Agle Mahine. Um, Hyderabad is set um, from July 1947 to September 1948. And some people are unaware, but uh, Hyderabad was the largest and wealthiest princely state in India. The Nizam of Hyderabad was the richest man in the world. And Hyderabad was ruled by a Muslim Nizam, but it was 85% uh, Hindu majority. Therefore, you know, India said, India claimed by the rules of partition, a majority non-Muslim state should go to India. But the Nizam could choose to be independent. That was the, uh, you know, the terms of, of partition.
But Hyderabad was also landlocked. It was right, as uh, Vallabhai Patel said, in the belly of India. And Muhammad Ali Jinnah had a huge interest in making sure that Hyderabad either came to Pakistan or stayed independent. So I'm trying to capture that dilemma here again, that we have a two threads. We have the thread in Delhi with uh, Pandit Nehru, who's now the Prime Minister of India, Vallabhai Patel, who's the Deputy Prime Minister and the Home Minister, and Dickie Mountbatten, who is now the Governor General of India. And then I'm capturing Hyderabad, where there is the Nizam of Hyderabad, his courtiers, uh, and his army of volunteers uh, called Razakars and the common people. There is also a communist movement which is afoot and uh, there is sort of this battle uh, between people and again the speculation what is going to happen to Hyderabad. So I'm trying to capture the dilemmas of the common people and the political leaders and how Hyderabad finally got integrated into India. The third book is Kashmir which again as we know you know we still have an ongoing uh, battle with Pakistan over Kashmir and I feel a lot of people uh, do not understand the situation, the way it evolved. And therefore, that narrative is set in, uh, you know, uh, from independence to 15 months after. And I'm trying to show what was happening. Kashmir was, in a sense, the exact opposite of Hyderabad. It was a Muslim majority state, but ruled by a Hindu king, uh, Hari Singh, Maharaja Hari Singh. And, uh, um, you know, the, the situation there is different. The war came much earlier. Uh, and so I'm trying to capture all that. Again, there's the Delhi thread and the Kashmir thread. And uh, the, my hope is that, uh, you know, as I said, I'm trying to bring history to my readers through fiction. And my hope is that after reading these books, uh, you know, we as Indians have a better understanding of our own history. And we have more empathy, more for our own uh, neighbors and citizens and also for our political leaders uh, for whom it was a huge challenge uh, in a newly independent uh, country uh, you know to navigate the waters uh, of governance uh, thank you so much for all your answers ma'am i'm sure your upcoming novel is going to be huge success uh, as much as your all previous novels uh, thank you for coming here today Thank you. I really appreciate it. And I wish a great luck to the archive going forward. I want to put it on record that this is wonderful work that all of you are doing. And we are really grateful for that. Thank you so much, Ram. Uh, and those who are watching us, please tune in tomorrow for another amazing conversation with Nandita uh, Bhanani, Bhavnani, author of Sid Nama book, Sindh Nama book. The 1947 Partition Archive is hosting this series to commemorate 75 years of partition. Uh, this series is a daily micro podcast series being aired for 75 days between June 3rd and August 17th, except Sundays, to commemorate the 75th anniversary of partition in 2022. For context, August 17th is the day the Boundary Commission announced the Radcliffe Line separating India and Pakistan. 75 days after the partition plan was announced on June 3rd, 1947. Thank you very much again. And please show us your love and support by sending the hearts and like emojis under the video. For any query, DM us on social media or connect with any of our team members.